to worship with the Stanton Church of the Brethren. Thank you for joining us during these exceptional times as we offer this worship in a video format. My name is J.D. Glick and I am serving as the interim pastor of this congregation. Thanks also to the following persons who are assisting in our worship today. Nathaniel Lane is our worship leader, David McMillan, our hymn director and soloist, Galen Hevener, organist, and Mark Lane assisting behind the scenes. I invite you to give your attention now to the call, of worship, call to worship, which Nathaniel and I will be reading responsibly. he tells us about a man who asks his two sons to go to the vineyard to work. Both sons have difficulty matching their words with their actions. We gather in worship in the hopes that our faith will not only find expression in the words that we use this hour, but in how we live our lives. The father goes to his older son and says, go and work in the vineyard. I don't want to, the son answers, but later changes his mind and goes. We are grateful for the chance to change our minds and grow in our faithfulness to God. Doing so begins with repenting our sins. Jesus goes on to suggest that the father tells the other son to go work in the vineyard. Yes, sir, the son answers, but he does not go. There are times we make a promise, either to God or another person, but fail to keep our word. While our intentions may be good, we fall short of doing what we say we will. Jesus then asks, which one of the two sons did what his father wanted? Our opening hymn is, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. We will do the first verse, second and fourth. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Lord, I want to be more loving. And Lord, I want to be like Jesus.
us to understand how our actions impact other people and help us make good decisions based on our love for one another and for you. Amen. The scripture for today comes from Matthew chapter 21 verses 23 through 34 or 32. Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father said, then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two sons did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Charles Shelton begins his popular book of a past generation entitled, In His Steps, by recounting a Sunday morning worship service. As the Reverend Henry Maxwell is closing the big pulpit Bible over his manuscript at the end of the sermon, the worship is interrupted by the sound of a man's voice coming from the back of the sanctuary. An unshaven, shabbily dressed man walks down the center aisle. He reassures the congregation that he is neither drunk nor crazy but he wants to say something to them. No one, including Reverend Maxwell or the ushers, tries to stop the stranger. The young man shares that he had lost his job as a printer 10 months before because machines had made his job obsolete. Not knowing what else to do, he has been tramping all over the country finding many others in the same situation. The young man reminds the congregation that the pastor in his sermon had just suggested the necessity for Christians to follow in the steps of Jesus through obedience and imitation. The man asks, what does it mean to follow in the steps of Jesus? What does it mean when we sing I'll go with him, with him, all the way. The man goes on to recount more of his personal story. That his wife had died in a tenement house in New York City. His daughter was being cared for by friends until he could find a job. And he has found little sympathy in the church from the church people in this city in his search for a job. And again the man asks, what does it mean to follow in the steps of Jesus? This unexpected interruption prompts Reverend Maxwell in the coming months to challenge the members of the congregation that before they make any decision to first ask the question, what would Jesus do? The remainder of this book recounts the experiences of that pastor and his parishioners as they attempt to walk in the steps of Jesus in all they do and all they say. 
It seems to me that the issue behind the question, what would Jesus do, has to do with what authority we give to Jesus' teachings. How important do we consider it to follow the example of Jesus or to do what he instructs his followers to do? Does Jesus have enough authority in our lives that we find it important to do that? The issue of Jesus' authority is the question which is at the heart of the scripture that we heard Nathaniel read a few moments ago. It's helpful to look at the context of this incident. The setting is the last week of Jesus' life, and the scripture includes the accounts of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus driving out of the merchants and overturning the tables of the money changers in the courtyard of the temple, and Jesus cursing a non-bearing fig tree which dies. By this time, the leading priests and elders have just had enough of, of Jesus, and so they confront him by asking, By what right are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus proposes that he will answer their question if they will answer his. Jesus inquires about their understanding of who or what gave Jesus, excuse me, gave John the Baptist the authority to baptize. Did that authority come from heaven or was it human in its origin? The religious leaders immediately see the catch in Jesus' question. If the answer that John's authority comes from heaven, then they will be asked why they fail to give that same authority to Jesus, at whose baptism the voice from heaven announced, This is my son. If they answer that John's authority is human in its origin, they know that their answer will be challenged by the people who consider John the Baptist a prophet. Feeling caught, the religious leaders answer that they don't know the source of John the Baptist's authority. And Jesus says that he'll then not answer their questions regarding the source of his authority. But instead, interestingly, Jesus tells a story. A story about a man who has two sons. The father asks each, each of his sons to go and work in the vineyard. In response, the oldest son answers, he won't go. We see initially a rejection of the father's authority. But interestingly, Jesus suggests later that son has a change of heart and he does go and work in the field. You likely remember from your American history in school that the colony of Pennsylvania was founded by an English Quaker man by the name of William Penn. Interestingly, Penn was the son of an English naval admiral. Young Penn at first fit the role of an arrogant gentry accustomed to swaggering with a long sword at his side. Well, one Sunday, evidently, William Penn decides to visit a Quaker meeting. His presence in uniform with that sword upsets the members of the Quaker congregation who complain to their founder, George Fox. How could they tolerate this haughty member of the military dressed in his uniform and sword at their meetings as they proclaimed the gospel of peace? Fox agrees that he will speak to the young Penn and explain to him the Quaker position on pacifism. Having done so, Penn then asked Fox is he being told that he can no longer attend the Quaker meetings if he refuses to take off his sword? Fox assures Penn that he's welcome at their worship and he can wear his sword as long as he can do so 
in good conscience. At the age of 22, William Penn is converted to the pacifist beliefs of the Quakers and puts away his sword. While at first rejecting the authority of the Quakers, in time, William Penn experiences a change of heart and embraces the beliefs of the church that had welcomed him. In this parable, Jesus suggests the father instructs the younger son also to go and work in the vineyard. And this son reacts in just the opposite way of it as his older brother. This son responds, sure, Dad, I'll do it. The son seems to respect the father's authority, doing what the father had asked, but he never goes to the field as he had promised. He doesn't go to work in the vineyard, even though he said he would. The point is that this son in the end does not do what the father asked, even though at first he seemed to have accepted the father's instructions. In her book entitled Out of Africa, the Danish writer Isaac Deinson tells a story of a young boy named Kata, who appears at her door one day on her coffee plantation in Kenya and asks for a job. Could he work for her? She agrees to hire him and he turns out to be a very good servant. After three months, though, she, he asks her for a letter of recommendation that he would be able to work for a Muslim sheik. Upset at the thought of losing him, she offers to raise Kata's pay, but he's firm that he's going to leave. Kata explains that he had made the decision that he was going to either be a Christian or a Muslim. But before making that decision, he wanted to find out from first-hand experience how those two faiths live out their faith. Dyson was taken back to learn that she had been under the microscope of observation. But she understood that this young man wanted to learn firsthand how Christians live and how Muslims live before making up his mind regarding which group to which to belong. Dyson was aghast, as I say, that her life had been under the microscope of observation but she understood why Kata's desire to first of all observe firsthand life in a Christian home and life in a Muslim home to see how each group put their faith into action. After telling the story about the father who instructs his two sons to go and work in the vineyard, Jesus asked the religious leaders which of those two sons was obedient to the father? Which respected, in the end, the father's authority? Was it the son who said that he would work in the vineyard but never went? Or was it the son who rejected his father's request but in the end went and labored? Reluctantly, the religious leaders had to acknowledge that it was the one who had used, it was not the one who had used religious rhetoric or uttered words of faith, but instead the one whose actions gave evidence of obedience to what the Father wants. Many of you are familiar with Clarence Jordan as the author of the Cotton Patch version of the New Testament in which he uniquely sets the biblical story in his native Georgia. In addition to being a biblical scholar with a PhD in New Testament Greek, he, was a, he also was a farmer who had a great compassion for underprivileged persons. In the 1940s, Clarence Jordan started Koinonia Farms near America's Georgia as an interracial community in the Deep South. 
In fact, it was on this farm that Millard Fuller built the first houses for what later became known as Habitat for Humanity. Their experimental Christian community with blacks and whites living and working together was not well received by their southern neighbors. Their farm's produce were boycotted locally. They were not welcomed at the local white Baptist church. Their roadside stand was firebombed and caravans of the Ku Klux Klan harassed this interracial community. In the 1950s, Clarence Jordan approached his brother Robert, who later became a state senator and a justice in the Georgia Supreme Court, asking him to represent Koinonia Farms. And Robert replied, quote, Clarence, I can't do that. You know my political aspirations. Why, if I represented you, I might lose my job, my house, everything I've got. And Clarence reminds his brother, Bob, yes, and we as a community might lose everything we have if you don't represent us. Oh, that's different for you, Robert protests. But Clarence demands to know, why is it different? I remember, it seems to me, that you and I joined the church on the same Sunday as boys. I expect the preacher asked you the same question he asked me. He asked, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I said, yes. What did you say? Robert replies, oh, I follow Jesus to a point. Could that point by any chance be the cross, asked Clarence. That's right. I follow Jesus to the cross not on the cross. I'm not getting myself crucified. Clarence Jordan replies, then I don't believe you really are a disciple of Jesus. You're just an admirer of Jesus. I think you ought to go to your church, Robert, and tell them that you're just an admirer of Jesus and not a disciple. Yes, our words of faith alone are not enough because our actions speak louder than our words regarding the authority of Jesus in our lives. Amen. Mark and I will be doing a song you can sing along with. Trust and obey.
expression in our obedience to your teachings, which is visible in our daily lives. Hear us now as we pray as Jesus taught us using these words. Our Father in heaven, reveal to us who you are. Set the world right. Do what is best, as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving of others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. If you have a hymnal at home, uh, our hymn, last hymn is number 447. O oh, Jesus, I have promised, verse 1, 2, and 4.
having come to this time of worship to express our faith that yes, Jesus is Lord of our lives, which we have done in our words found in the hymns, prayers, and proclamations. Let us go now from this time with a renewed awareness of the importance of also expressing our faith that Jesus is Lord of our lives, doing so through our conduct and behavior, realizing after all, actions do speak louder than words. <laughs> 